we began with this famous portrait of Charles Darwin, but it was only the starting point for this evolutionary process, a process that took place continuously on my computer for 30 days. So this was quite a lengthy and involved process that took place over many generations of computer portraits. Of course, at the beginning, none of the portraits looked much like anything, but after many generations, bits of the resemblance began to creep in. You can see in this portrait, after several hundred generations, that this blind evolutionary process has begun to start getting some of the lighting and flesh tones from the original portrait. These portraits are made using combinations of these genomes that we saw. All of these different permutations are being generated or bred from the same set of basic visual functions. The evolutionary pressures come from the system testing each individual member of the population to see if it resembles the Darwin sitter image. One of the first really successful strategies that emerged was the system recognized that there was a strong vertical lighting in the original Darwin image. And so you can see immediately how the strategy was adopted and reused again and again in the population. The individuals that used this strategy were very successful and survived to breed and intermix with all the other strategies that were then developing. 20,000 populations in, this strategy became even more sophisticated. If vertical lighting was good, then very thin vertical lines must be even better. These allow a lot more subtlety to enter into the paintings. And in this image, we see the first portrait painting that really began to look like the Darwin Sitter image. It is still very rough, but the curve of the face and the lighting show hints of the evolutionary pressure at work. This individual was so successful that the system wasn't able to improve on it. We always keep around the most successful portrait from population to population. This face glow form, as I like to call it, was so successful that no new offspring were able to dethrone it. This is where the other, more broad artistic aspect of our creative model came into play. Getting stuck on this one painting activated a functional trigger that told the system to go creatively wide. That is, rather than being doggedly focused on trying to resemble Darwin, our algorithm went wide and brought those three fuzzy rules of art in. This is akin to an artist getting stuck and deciding to go to the desert for 30 days just to straighten his head. You can see how the works created here are some of the most colorful and diverse paintings at this point in the process. What is interesting is how even though it wasn't focused on Darwin's resemblance, and this happens with creative people and scientists as well, when they are not focused on a specific problem, the act of loosening up is often enough to provoke an aha moment that brings back a solution to the original focused problem. So the process left with this image, but returned back with this image. So even though it went wide and wasn't thinking about resemblance, it came back with something that was more successful at resemblance than any other strategy. This new strategy was so successful that it basically just took over, ushering in this sculptural age, which I like to call the soft blobby age. Eyes showed up and disappeared again. And it's important to note that all these paintings are related. In a way, they are all alive. Each of their genomes their set of instructions that create them is related to the others. So you may see something like an eye show up in this painting, and then it may disappear again. But the strategy for creating an eye is still somewhere within the genes, waiting to be expressed again. This is similar to how recessive and dormant traits work in humans. Perhaps your grandfather has musical talent, and your dad doesn't, but you do. You still got there through your dad, but the genes were dormant in him, waiting to be re-expressed in you. So we went through a big sculptural age, which lasted for many generations. The next big epoch that happened, if I were to break it down into separate periods, was what I call the raccoon patch age. In this age, the strategy of creating this darker raccoon patch emerged, which resembles the shadowy area around Darwin's eyes, and it started to appear everywhere. You can see a bunch of older strategies emerging, except this time, with a raccoon patch. Another thing that happens a lot in evolution is that good strategies get reused. So you can see how, at a very early stage, the raccoon patch appears to be reused as a very thin shape that I like to call the veil. You can see how this veil is trying to capture this very particular green shape on Darwin's forehead. This is an example of computer evolution mimicking human evolution.
What is interesting here from a creative standpoint is, even for traditional painters, there's things to be gleaned from this process. You still might not think of something like a raccoon patch, or a raccoon patch in negative space, or putting a boulder where the raccoon patch was, or some of these other ideas. So while it is debatable whether this is real creativity, it is still very wide. And from a genetic computer creativity point of view, there are many ideas that would be useful for a human to pick up on. Within the latter sections of the sculptural age, the paintings become more and more textural. They begin to pare down and the portraits start to look more and more like the Darwin shape. The raccoon patch and other strategies never completely go away, but begin to intermingle as more texture comes in. In this very late stage, the process begins to converge on some of its closest resemblance to the Darwin image, even while maintaining the past sculptural, textural, and now even colorful strategies. It is typically at this point that I'm told, but it hasn't fully converged on the Darwin likeness. And in fact, the closest one is this one here, where you can see it has started to put in the beard, the rosiness under the eyes, the raccoon patch, and other features. Nearing the end of this 30-day non-stop process, the paintings evolved to some small resemblance of the Darwin painting. But the point was never about pure, perfect resemblance. Computers can achieve that in a single line of code. This work was about using Darwin's painterly gaze and his evolutionary process as a spark for working within an emergent-based creative process to attempt to bring the ghost of creativity out of the machine and, in a way, rethink portraiture.